send them to YouTube. And I will be posting, I can post the link to the YouTube live URL um, in the chat box if you want to share it. Great. And I will be posting, I can post the link go. to the Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the live stream, the Women in Film Metro East co-production. Um, we have a special talk with Kate here, who is a Women in Film board member and a kick-ass producer. And she's here to talk with us about her experience producing a frontline and PBS documentary called Coronavirus Pandemic, A Tale of Two Washingtons. And it does a really interesting job of examining kind of the intersection between science and politics. Um, so we're not quite getting started quite yet. Just wanted to start the live stream. Uh, I'm gonna send this URL out. That's going and just on. bear with us. And that's going on Facebook now? The it's going on YouTube. Well, we'll send, we'll put the link out on um, Facebook, but it is live streaming through YouTube. Yeah. And I am in, speaker view so i need to switch that to gallery view let's see if that works yeah there we go i did the same are we seeing both of us yeah and then there's someone looks like there's a chat okay daria there daria's on okay <laughs> great so i think we're all set hopefully let's just make sure that um we are sending the URL to the right people so we can post it to our Facebook. And we'll just kind of give a couple more minutes for people to kind of come in. Welcome everybody who's here on the Zoom call. Um, super stoked to see it that we have so many attendees. Very exciting. Um, if you have a question, and this is for anyone, um, if you have a question, please write it out and we will answer it live. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, there is a Q&A option. Go ahead and write your question down there, like below. Um, and I will read those as, as we're talking and kind of help moderate those. If you're watching on YouTube Live, feel free to write your questions in the comment section. And, oh, we already got some really lovely chats from people. Um, so yeah, I think we should go ahead and start. Um, if you're ready, Kate. I'm ready. All righty. <laughs> so let's start off with a little brief introduction for those of us who don't know you. Um, who are you? Uh, where Where are you located? And kind of uh, tell us what you do. What is your What is your career? What is your um, <laughs> What is your field in the production space? All the existential questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Kate McMahon and I am a producer director of documentaries. I started working in this profession way back in the 90s uh, as an intern at OPB in 1998. Um, that was with the News Hour with Jim Lair. And a couple of years later, I came back to then uh, be an associate producer um, with, with Lee Hochberg for the news hour with Jim Lair. And that was really the bedrock of, of my career path. Um, I have I call it kind of a revolving door I've had at OPB. I've been in and out as a staff employee, as a project employee. Um, in 2000, I want to say five, um, I became a co-producer on my first Frontline documentary that was a co-production with OPB and Frontline and actually in partnership with the Oregonian. That was the, the film, The Meth Epidemic, the first version. We did an update to it a few years later, but that was kind of the beginning, the gateway into um, subsequent work I did for Frontline. Um, however, not again with OPB, but with independent producers and directors. Um, the last frontline before this that I finished was an update to the vaccine war uh, that I produced with John Palferman. And John and I had produced, I think it was uh, five, I think, front lines together. Um, Carl Biker and I also produced the meth epidemic together and life and death inside assisted living together. Um, 
in the time between the vaccine war in the, that aired in 2015 and this front line, um, I was producing a series for OPB and for public media called Hacking Your Mind. And that's a science series about behavioral science and the machinery inside the human brain that helps us form judgments and make decisions. So that's forthcoming, that's coming out later this year. And then um, in 2011, one of the front lines I produced was nuclear aftershocks about um, the, the future, uh, the future of nuclear power after the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown and the implications of that disaster on the nuclear industry. So that was when I first um, joined forces with Miles O'Brien. He was our correspondent for that film. He was not a producer, but he was a correspondent and a writer. And we went uh, all around America and to Germany filming and, um, that's when we first, um, yeah, that's when we first became friends and colleagues. And that was the last time I worked with him actually, uh, which was, yeah, nine years ago, so. Wow. Yeah. Wow, quite the history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm curious to know how you got involved in this most recent documentary. Um, for those of you just joining now, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. We're talking with Kate about her documentary, Coronavirus Pandemic, A Tale of Two Washingtons. And this is a Frontline documentary. And for those of us who aren't familiar with Frontline, they're an Emmy-winning, Peabody-winning series, um, arguably America's top long-form series since the 1980s. So, you know, really great stuff that they've been producing for decades now. Um, yeah. So I'm curious to know, you know, how 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 did you get involved in this? Because I I do understand it was a really short kind of timeline from when when you found out that you had to get your way up to Seattle and you didn't have that much time to even process. Mm -hmm. uh, what did that look like for you? Well, in the years since the last Frontline, I you know I've tried to keep in touch with the folks at Frontline. You know, the the executive producers and the senior editors. I follow them in social media, so I kind of have a like an ear to the ground of what they're reporting on, what's coming out. Um, it was early March when I, I saw some, uh, some messages on Facebook, I think it was that Frontline was going to be um, rolling out a, a documentary for April 21st about the pandemic. And it was going to have, I think two, two stories in an hour. And so on March 14th, I texted, the executive producer, Rainey Aronson, and said, hey, I, I did the math and I figured that you are probably in production right now on the forthcoming Frontline. And if you need any help, if you're gonna be in Seattle, I'm just down here in Portland and I could, you know, I'd be happy to help if you need it. And she immediately wrote back and said, yes, we, <laughs> that would be great. This is a Miles O'Brien project. And I said, great, I love Miles. So. Um, then Miles and I got on text and we're, you know, figuring out what to do. And before I knew it, uh, that next Monday, I'm driving in my car to Seattle. So, you know, I think the, the takeaway from that is just, um, just to sort of just jump in. I mean, what's, what's the harm in, in checking, checking out, you know, does, do they need help? And so, um, the answer was yes, I was up there on the 16th. Our mission for the, at that stage was to produce, um, was to produce a half an hour as part of a, a full hour with two different stories. There was another team based, I think in the, in the Midwest that would um, fill out the second half of the hour. And we, I think we had a budget for, you know, five days of filming. So we spent that first week in Seattle, uh, Miles and our DP who's from Portland, Maine. His name is Ezra Wolfinger. Um, and we filmed our five days. And uh, the last day we were, um, we were all getting ready to travel back. Miles and Ezra were at the airport heading back east. And um, Miles gets a call from Rainey, who said, you know, I think we need to change course. I think this story is still unfolding in Seattle. And what do you say to the idea of staying and continuing your reporting on the ground there? And so as it happened, our DP needed to get back home. So he flew back and I told Miles, look, I'm, I'm not leaving you here by yourself. I have my camera packet package. I, you know, you're gonna need producing <laughs> help. Um, 
And so, so it was just the two of you at this time. And so then it just became miles and me. And so the wow. crazy thing is that, um, Seattle was, you know, day by day, it was, you know, kind of spiraling down, you know, into this, um, shutdown mode. And the hotel that we had been in that first week was the largest hotel in the Pacific Northwest. It's, um, the Hyatt Regency, it has 1200 rooms. And when we were in it, there were only like eight other people in it. So, you know, 1% <laughs> of the um, hotel was, uh, was used. And when That's we so left, eerie. That's it so was eerie. very eerie. It was, and we were scrounging for food, but the day we left, we, you know, we had our rooms booked only for those that first week. Um, they didn't let us stay. They said, no, when you check out, we're shutting and locking the keys, you know, the door. So we had to then find a new hotel, which was just a few blocks away, smaller, but um, still, you know, kind of a ghost town inside. And so Miles and I, um, you know, had rooms next door and it was just like, we just sort of owned this entire floor of a hotel for those two weeks. And we would, you know, we just went back into pre-production and research and booking and, um, then eventually more shooting. Now, having said all that, we were the only two in Seattle, but we had at that, so we had, a, Miles has a production company with, um, I think it's five people all together, including himself uh, for, it's called Mobius Productions. And they are just, you know, total aces. They're great producers, great researchers, and a great production manager. Um, and then Frontline threw in just an amazing a team of uh, editors and senior editorial senior editors um and so all of a sudden we had this you know just like rock star all-star team to to work with even though they were remote and we weren't in, ever in the same room with them we were on video uh zoom and blue jeans chats um and so that that is the secret sauce to how in six weeks, we could produce a full frontline investigation is because we we were given the resources, the human power to do that. Let's talk a little bit about that six weeks that you just mentioned. You know, how, how long do these documentaries usually take um, and why is six weeks so mind-blowing? Well, um, a typical frontline, the, the ones I've produced in the past are, they take six to nine months to produce typically. Um, maybe even longer. And so this is, you know, six weeks. So it was, um, I mean, <laughs> interestingly, so for, for the people that we were trying to book, you know, like the governor of, of Washington state, the Senator, um, we would ask them, Hey, can you inter give us an interview? It's airing on April 21st. And they looked at that and it was weeks away. And it, to them, it seemed like an eternity away to us it felt like a nanosecond like but you don't understand <laughs> like this normally takes many months and we're doing this in a few weeks and so um everything was just rapid i mean it was like high speed motion and long long days now the the difference for me and miles is that because we were kind of in quarantine in seattle anyway all we had to do was work and for the folks who were back East working remotely, they were balancing you know, their families inside their homes where they were also doing work. And so I just think I have so much additional respect for them for pulling off what we, what we were all doing, but with that added complication of you know, homeschooling their kids and all of those other things. Um, Cause now I'm, I'm in it. So I can, I have a full appreciation of that now. <laughs> So tell so you mentioned long days. I assume, you know, as producers and as people in the industry, we're very familiar with the long day um, during production. Can you walk us through a typical day or maybe one of the most surprising days um, of production while you were up there? And just like, you know, yeah, yeah. From beginning to end, kind of. So the longest day, the longest day, and which later became kind of a heartbreaking thing is um, we heard of a, a guy out in Spokane who um, is an engineer and he was figuring out how to design a prototype for a, a homemade DIY ventilator so that in the days of ventilator shortages, um, last resort, 
anyone could take the prototype and buy the parts to it at a Home Depot for $200 or less. And so um, everybody was really interested in this story as like this heroic example of people just cutting through red tape and doing what needed to get done. And on the other hand, the fact that it's so pathetic that it's necessary because there weren't enough you know, government provisions to supply enough ventilators. And so Miles and I drove from Seattle to Spokane. It's a five hour drive. I think we left, you know, at like 7 a.m., five hours. Then we got there, we filmed for five hours and then we drove back for five hours. So it was probably end to end more like a 17 or 18 hour day. Um, and the road conditions were not good. Um, there was snow over the pass and everything. And um, it was just a great day of filming. It, he gave us a great interview. We did this amazing scene with him and his fellow engineers who were sort of mind hiving the design process on their Zoom or their video call. We went to the Home Depot and followed him like picking out the parts um, and it never made it into the show. So that was oh, the man. heartbreaking part, which just happens. And long ago, I learned not to get too attached to the to any particular shoot because you just never know what's gonna have to, you know, the difficult decisions that we make. Um, so that that was our that was our longest day of production that day. And this this question was kind of inspired by a question from Todd, one of our um, Hi, Todd. viewers. Uh, I'm curious how, how. So your role on set, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but um, and you said you shot that whole that whole scene that was cut, right? Yeah, and you yeah. had a camera package there. Um, yeah. The tech side of me wants to know what camera you used. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, what was your role primarily shooting or like? Yeah. What, what, how much, how much reading did you do compared to scheduling or compared to interviewing or compared to whatever yeah. your typical duties are as a producer? So we, we discovered the character through our sources um, at Providence Regional Medical Center. They, that was the, that's where patient one was discovered and we did a lot of filming with them. And so their public relations folks told us about their employee out in Spokane who works not in medicine, but in like, I think he, he retrofits old buildings to be um, medical centers. And anyway, so he was, he's actually a Providence employee, but he was not doing this for Providence. He was, he was doing this on his own and, and they, they condoned it, but they, you know, it was just sort of his own idea. Um, so the character development side was pretty, was pretty straightforward. Everybody was on board. There wasn't a lot of, you know, kind of classic, you know, persuasion that needed to happen to get him on board. Um, but the technical side of it, yes, I had my camera package. It was, I have a Sony SF5. I have my, um, I have my, uh, my wireless mics, my boom, you know, all the stuff. But what I didn't have for that day was my light kit because two days before my car had been broken into and my light kit was stolen out of my car. Oh my God. So I, that, I had to order a new one um, from B&H, which had not arrived yet. So we were just going, we went with my camera, the FS5, Miles has an A7. And then I have my, wow. um, my iPhone, it's the Pro Max, the 11. So it has the three cameras. And this, so what I did for the Home Depot sequence, which is maybe a reason why we didn't, um, why it couldn't get in the show is that we kind of went a little bit rogue and we just, I just did, um, I filmed using this, which was, it turned out it looked really good. <laughs> um, and what I did was I put wireless mics on um, Miles and our the, the, the character. Um, and then I sent the signal to my Zoom which and just plugged in the the receivers um, into my Zoom and then put a handbag over my shoulder and tucked all the the recording equipment inside my Zoom. So it was so we didn't freak anybody out. We didn't have like you know obvious microphones, obvious cameras. We were you know none of the customers were disturbed. It was just now we didn't ask for permission um, to do that. So it was you know we would have had to work out. Um, 
the, you know, the location issues if it were going to make it into the show. But it was a really good example of how these phones can really get you through um, in certain scenarios. Other than that, my my FS5 did the harder work of, you know, the the scene work and the sequences. So that that looked it was more, you know, cinematic from that camera. But that's how we ended up doing all that. Hmm. And how many other camera ops did you have? So, um, so as it worked out, so the, the, um, let's see, so Ezra went back, then it was me and Miles, and then um, a DP from Portland, Jason Green, and a, an audio engineer from Ashland uh, came up to Seattle for another week of filming. And the reason we um, went with people who who needed, you know, who were technically out of town was um, <laughs> working with folks who who also had to go back to their families every night was problematic when you have to social distance. So we were going places and being exposed to places and people that might have the virus. And so both of the, the guys that we brought up um, could self-isolate without too much, you know, disruption. They they live alone, so um, we were able to, you know, make that work. And they stayed at our hotel. Um, they get, the hotel gave us a really good cut rate, the COVID rate. <laughs> and um, so then we had a crew. Then we had sound. We had, you know, um, a really nice uh, FS7 that was a good match to the Aria Mira that we had started with. After they left and after I left Seattle, I went back on April 4th to start my self-isolation for two weeks before I could reintegrate with my own family. And when I came back to Portland, then, if, then I think a week later, Ezra ended up flying back from the East Coast and reconnected with Miles and um, they did some additional shooting and some pickup shots. Um, in those final few days. And that was just really close to when we were actually delivering. I mean, we were the whole time we were in kind of pre-production, production production, and post-production all stacked together. Um, And that was only possible because going back to my previous point, we had this, you know, huge A team of, you know, 12 or more people able to take on all those parts simultaneously. Wow. Yeah. Sounds stressful. Um, speaking of speaking of social, uh, you were saying uh, I, you were quarantining before you met your family. I do want to hear that story because I know it's um, it's just intense to have to do that. Um, but we do have a question from maybe Elizabeth, 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 um, about how social distancing rules impacted production, if at all. Yeah. Um, well, they did. In fact, um, in the beginning. We, in the beginning, we were mostly concerned with just ourselves and, you know, not touching our faces, washing our hands um, all the time, um, covering our mouths, you know, kind of staying a little bit apart. But then as the, as production wore on, it really became more of like access to people. And um, especially with the elected officials in the beginning, if, if a few let us interview them in their offices, well, then by the end, when we interviewed the governor and Senator Murray, um, they, and even Brad Smith of Microsoft, no one was doing in-person interviews at that point. I mean, part of it was the, the sincere safety concern. The other part of it is the optics of it, that they need to model what they're saying to do. So um, there was just no hope of getting anyone in person. And what we had to do, what we figured out as a workaround and is that um, the, the video part of a screen to screen interview is okay. Well, how we set those up was um, we had a, we had a cam- our camera with, in the room with Miles and that was, we made his room into part of the story and kind of Miles' own um, evolution uh, along with the pandemic. You, you just, you kind of saw him doing the, the, you know, the daily grind of the work and, um, and it was a little bit that personal touch. So you had the, the camera in the room with Miles and then you had the screen, the two screens recorded, just like we're doing now. And then, um, so the audio, the video was okay, but the audio, the first one we did, the audio was just so, it was so problematic. It would, you know, hitch up or it would, it just sounded like that, that low bit rate, you know, tinny sound. 
So we figured out, we just asked the person on the other end to record, you know, voice memo or whatever, just set it down on their desk. And then we would sync that up. So at least the, this is better quality audio than what you're getting, than what we're getting through our computers. And that was the, that was a real breakthrough. Um, and it sounded so much better than when you're, then when you're hearing their voice over something else, um, it doesn't sound like it's a computer recording. It actually sounds like semi-quality audio. The, the the hacks of documentary filmmaking yeah yeah um could I, I realize we haven't really talked about what this documentary was about other than in a couple of sentences mm -hmm. um, could you maybe go into that a little um what what was the what was the aim and the goal of the documentary and what do you think it did well yeah so i i didn't have i wasn't on board when the brainstorming phase was already happening that was between miles and his production company and um they they have been producing for nova um i think they have several novas maybe seven under their belt already and for the news hour and so miles is truly a veteran science correspondent he has a long history of science reporting um, with a kind of special niche in aviation and nasa um subjects but um he he they i think they just they rattled off a pitch really fast ran it by um by frontline rainy and um came up with this idea of a tale of two washingtons that um there were divergent decisions being made at, in washington state and and washington dc that washington state was really um obviously uh listening to experts and and making decisions driven by data and science and Washington DC um, appeared to be driven much more in a political way. Um, and so there were differences in outcomes. There were, you know, from the federal side and the state side. And the, the really fascinating thing is that that, that was such a prescient um, way to see it because as we stayed in Seattle, the, the, the fallout of those divergent decision-making um, became quite clear you know there was there was a fight that actually um kind of sparked between the governor of washington and president trump um and there were you know and you hear president trump you know calling the governor of washington a snake <laughs> and so um you know then it's uh you know becomes a question of like you know how much is politics getting in the way of solutions um, and I think, you know, the person who kind of encapsulated it the best was um, the mayor of Seattle, Jenny Durkin, who said, you know, what's, what's happening is we've, we've entered this hunger games process of, you know, trying to, we're bidding city against city, state against state for provisions like, you know, masks and ventilators and, and supplies that we need. And, and that's something that's just been the fallout of this, you know, kind of political, uh, you know, warfare happening. So um, we didn't necessarily see all that coming, but it was happening in front of us kind of day by day. And we, and that's, that was to, to Rainey Aronson's credit, that was, you know, her vision of you know, keeping us to keep us there and to keep reporting really paid off because that that did, um, you know, we were able to bring that to the fore, um, in a you know, just like in real time. Yeah, I mean, and not to mention how fast things are moving, but like back in March, thing like every day was like a total different game. So just the fact that she had you stay an extra two weeks or week is like, you know, a year's worth of content basically, because it was all so crazy during that time and all so compact and dense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. And, um, you know, just keeping, we had a, we had a, a Megan Robertson who um, her previous or most recent film had been a frontline about amazon.com and uh, the, the kind of the um, inside kind of corporate culture at, at Amazon and, um, Megan from the start was just this amazing secret weapon when it came to rolling on newsreel and you know news events um, both 
at the local level. She was finding stuff coming out of Washington State, the federal level in the White House. And she created this timeline and Miles had the idea of, you know, color coding it and hashtagging, you know, so that, so that basically it was this deep, deep menu of, okay, we need a clip of Governor Inslee saying X, Y, Z. Okay, find it, found. And it was all so perfectly organized and also archived already. And then, um, then it was just a matter of like, you know, swapping out for, you know, for finals or for cleared. And we had the um, benefit of having Frontline's um, rights manager on our team too. So all of that stuff was just like so streamlined. Cause if you notice the, the film, you know, all of the Washington DC stuff is mostly, it's unoriginal footage. It's like newsreel or new, you know, um, White House footage or it's not ours. And part of the reason for that is because even though we made repeated requests to interview folks in Washington at CDC and NIH and Fauci and Pence and, you know, the list goes on, no one in in Washington DC um, accepted our requests. We, we, we just didn't get them. So we at least had the newsreel to use. And then of course we had some, um, we had some experts and some former CDC officials and HHS officials um, able to talk to us remotely, but that's, wow. yeah, that was a challenge, not having access to the federal side. Um, I would like to take this moment to just remind our viewers on YouTube and Facebook that you can uh, write in your own questions that you'd like to hear from Kate in the YouTube comment section or um, just comment on the Facebook event and I will, those will get to me and I will get those to Kate. So just a quick reminder there. Um, so Kate, I noticed there was a good amount of footage that you guys filmed in the hospitals there. I think it was Providence. Um, and evergreen, yeah. And evergreen. Yeah. What, could you like describe the, the vibe there, the feeling? I mean, I'm sure that must have been crazy. Like what, what was that like, you know, yes, from a producer's standpoint, but also just from like a human standpoint, just like being at the epicenter of this thing and just like each hour you're realizing the enormity of like what's happening and you're like, I don't know seeing the vials and you're seeing the test kits and it just makes it so much more real for me it it took a while for it to sink in but i'm sure you were like confronted with it you know in the most intense way possible so what what was that like i think it's i think there was a there was a function of you know that feeling of being on the outside of the fishbowl a little bit like um that i was there you know, we were at the, we were in the COVID ward at Providence um, where patient one had been discovered. We were in the emergency room areas and there was this, you know, this kind of strange dichotomy between, you know, the, I'm the observer and we're, we're observing this story and these people, you know, in this situation. And yet then there'd be this flash of, wait a second, but we are also in the air here. So, and the air itself is, um, a risk to us. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there was this unusual sense of, um, being in the story in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, Miles is part of the story. He's our intrepid guide, you know, the journalist's journey into the, the worlds, uh, where, where he's finding the people on the front lines and he's wearing the masks and we wore masks, um, some of the time, um, it, they weren't always available to us everywhere we went. Yeah. Uh, the hospitals checked our, you know, our vital signs to, to be able to come in, um, just like any visitor would. And um, we were extremely careful to not touch um, objects or our faces. Um, there were some instances where just audio was tricky because we needed to put uh, lav, a lav mic on someone. And so we had to kind of teach them how, and you couldn't get too close. Um, but on the other hand, it wasn't really the hospitals that, that were the, this is just sort of, it's strangely ironic. The hospitals were the most sanitized places. You know, they're the places that were wiped down the most. They had, you know, everyone there is wearing PPE and gloves. And so you don't feel like that, kind of exposure, um, that contact. 
level that you might, you know, somewhere else, like out in Seattle or in somebody's office. Um, I don't know. There, it was all very strange. You were, you know, just being so um, in touch with your physicality was definitely a, a different way to be in production. It was a bit distracting, I'd say. Can you talk about uh, what Miles said on your ferry ride into Seattle about the, the science fiction comment? I, I just love that. Yeah, this, this he, he's such a good writer. And, you know, we have, you know, we had a, a so many different, it was like this hive mind of, of writers too. So, but I'm guess I, I think this was Miles's own um, way of putting it. It was right out in the, in the top of the show when he says that he's been you know covering science stories for over 35 years and he came to seattle to to see the story here but nothing prepared him for what felt less like science and more like science fiction um, because the pandemic had brought this city to its knees and he's you know we're on the ferry and he's it, this is a moment where you're it's a contemplative moment where miles is gazing out the window of the ferry and it was kind of a foggy classic seattle day in march late late winter and um it's the the ferry is just desolate i mean i think we saw two ferry workers and one or two passengers and you know hardly any cars on the ferry this is a this is a ferry that's normally a main you know, vein into Seattle from Bainbridge Island. And so, um, yeah, I thought that was a great way to start, you know, to kind of frame the, the show and to join, you know, kind of come along with Miles into, you know, his journey of like, what is, what is this tale of two Washingtons? And, you know, let's, let's explore with him this story. That literally just gave me goosebumps, just. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Um, so what happened after production for you? So you left, you had to social distance. What did that, and you, I, and you have a family and children. Talk a little bit about that experience. So I left on April 4th, I left and then uh, came to Portland and stayed in a hotel for two weeks, um, just a couple miles away from my house, um, right down on the Willamette River. And, you know, I was still, you know, finishing the show, but remotely now. So all of the things, all of the, you know, final fact checking. And I think actually it was from Portland that I booked and set up the, um, the interview with Senator Murray, Patty Murray, um, who gave the interview like just a week or so before air. And um, so it was just at that point, it was a lot like what I normally do from my home office as an independent producer, only I was not in my home. <laughs> I was in a hotel and um, I now was for the first time in all of that time, having to find food on my own, like everyone else here. So going to the grocery store, I hadn't been to a grocery store in Seattle. I went to a Walgreens a couple of times, but that, you know, and then the rest of it was just mostly getting Starbucks sandwiches and the restaurant inside the hotel. I mean, it was, that was about it. You didn't have a kitchen, right? So you couldn't even cook for yourself. No, no kitchen. Oh, that sounds miserable. No. <laughs> oh. And, um, you know, it was, we, we, we were saying, you know, God, we have to have another Starbucks sandwich. It's like, <laughs> it's going to take me years. Yeah. Um, and so, um, anyway, so what I really then started sensing was um, coming into the fishbowl. Like now I'm starting to live the way that I had been observing other people doing for weeks. Now I'm here and I have to like um, play by the same rules now. Up in Seattle, we had the essential workers exemption uh, journalists get, and we had carried around our our papers that had, I think they were notarized even, but that were written by Rainier and Sin at Frontline and saying, naming our names that we can be out doing this work. Um, in Portland, th the idea was was not that. It was, no, you, you self-isolate and be all cleared before you go back to your family. I mean, or else what's the point, <laughs> you know? So um, I had to then learn social distancing like that. And, and then it just threw me into a, a 
more of a like, God, I really respect what people have been doing this whole time and how seriously everyone is taking this. It, it, it was, it was a lot different than just observing it to have to experience it. We have a question here from Maureen. Um, and the question is, did you have the story outlined? And we, I realize you weren't part of the pre-production really phase, but did, I guess, was there a story outlined before you started or did you find the sort story developed itself as you started to investigate? There was, uh, there was a, that's a good question, Maureen. Thank you for that question. Um, there was a, I mean, typically a frontline is a, a frontline pitch is is really well researched and there is a really strong outline so this wasn't typical and it, i wouldn't say it was a, a full outline but miles and his team had written up the proposal um as it as i said you know tale of two washingtons and an investigation into the differences in decision decision making and outcomes but once it was green lit and we were on the ground reporting, it was really just following the story as it unfolded, keeping our eye. And when I say our, I mean the whole team, we, this whole team of us was, you know, keeping, keeping our eye on big picture. And of course, while we were there is when New York really hit its peak and, and uh, Governor Cuomo was, um, you know, in the news every single day. Um, so, and New York became the epicenter then. So, you know, we had, we have, this is a national program. We have to make it relevant from, you know, Seattle to New York to Oklahoma city. And, um, so even, even Rainey Aronson, I mean, she's reading the New York times and keeping her eye on it. So, you know, everybody is, um, but, you know, it's an interesting thing when you, when, when you're in kind of pre-production, production, and post all at the same time stacked like that. Um, the decision-making is really fast. Uh, the script writing is, you know, all, always kind of changing. And there were there were changes all the way up to the very last bits of, of post-production. In fact, I think over the weekend before we aired, we were short four minutes. We didn't have four minutes to fill, you know, <laughs> it's not like um, some documentaries that can be kind of whatever length they need to be with PBS programs. You have like, I think it's like 56 minutes and 46 se seconds. And that's the time you have to fill. And so miles being up in Seattle still um, and with his, with Ezra back to shoot again um, was able to, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's kind of, it's sort of miraculous, but they figured out to get into Evergreen hospital and get a couple more interviews that turn out to be really key and uh, see kind of the impact on uh, medical workers there even and and some patients some very abstract uh, non-identifiable patient b-roll and um, the the blood donor the convalescent blood donor who just happened to be out you know that day you know the day they were filming um, she was the first blood donor to, to try this in Seattle. Can you, and can you the, give a little information for those oh, who sorry. Didn't watch the documentary or who don't know about what the blood donor thing is? Yeah, all. so um, like a hundred years ago, doctors um, started using donor blood to, um, to take the antibodies from the Spanish flu pandemic and injecting it into um, folks who have, who are actively fighting the the disease, the virus, because the antibodies from someone else can come in and be these foot soldiers inside the, you know, the current sick person. And so um, it's, it's um, called convalescent plasma. And basically the, they take your blood out, they shake it up and they take the plasma from it. And then that's what's used to, um, to, to help the sick person. And I think one, I think it's one, one blood donor can help up to four people one blood donation can help up to four people. Wow. And so a lot of uh, COVID survivors want to do this. They want to do their part. I mean, why not? If they can help four other people, it kind of seems like that's the, that's the altruistic thing to do in their minds. And so this, this woman um, agreed to let us film her um, going through the process of donating her plasma. And that was not in, that was never something you know, like in a treatment or outline that we originally wrote to, it's something that 
was part of the process of discovery that just happened. And um, one of the guys on our team, a producer named um, uh, Fedor, um, great researcher, just really science-minded, and he had kept his eye on serology, which is the study of you know the study of this and and the plasma donors. He's been he kind of had this on his radar um, early on, and you know because he was kind of already looking at it when when Blood Works Northwest, which is the the blood bank, when they um, when when they were up and ready, I think they connected with Fedor and said, "Hey, we know you're looking at this, and we've got someone coming in, you know, next next day. Can, and if you guys want to film it, we'll open our doors to you." So, um, you know, we had Fedor, we had Caleb, we had Will, we had Megan, um, myself in Seattle. But you know, we had we had all these people kind of developing stories, uh, you know, and and earning the trust of sources, and you know getting permission and access you know a great story is is great but access to it is a film <laughs> so um so what, what does that look like so you have all these people working remotely they're science minded they're researching the crap out of the the issues that they think are going to lead to a story and then the next step for them is reaching out to healthcare officials and whoever else asking for interviews like mm -hmm. I, what is that? I, I'm not really, I'm not part of huge teams like this typically. So I'm just curious to know what that actually looks like. I mean, thank God for things like Google Drive because you can all work in the same document. You can all see, you know, we had this huge um, Google Docs kind of spreadsheet of we had the, the Washington state contacts, we had the Washington DC contacts, and we had like those of us who were assigned to various you know, pursuits, you know, sources and and uh, so people weren't, there was no redundancy or there wasn't sort of stepping on other people's work. It was like, okay, you're doing this, you're doing this, we're doing this. And then as it kind of happened, um, I would be, I would be, you know, trying to book someone and then, you know, one of my teammates would follow up or vice versa. They would, you know, get onto it. And then I would follow up a lot of the time for me. Um, one of the other team members would get something going. And then because I was there, I would kind of finish it out. And then I'd be the person in person once we started filming. So um, I might not have made an initial contact, but it was just that kind of like synergistic um, teamwork, really. I mean, it, it, it and, and the thing is, is that everybody on this team was so nice and so, there was just no ego in the way. I mean, no one got no one got tripped up over, hey, that's mine, or that felt territorial about anything. If and and same thing with if if something didn't work out, I mean, there was never any like sense of like failure on anyone's you know account or or you know sort of accusations of you know you didn't try hard enough. It was it was never about that for us. We were just um, all we just all had each other's backs. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, uh, ego tends to be a problem sometimes on set. So I'm glad that that wasn't the case <laughs> this time. Um, we have one more question from Elizabeth, Beth. Um, are Miles and Frontline going to keep reporting on Washington State, and are there going to be any follow-ups? Um, there, uh, yes, there are going to be follow-ups. Frontline is going to continue reporting on the pandemic story. It's you know it's. The unfortunate truth is that we're a long ways away from this being over. I mean, honestly, the end of this is when um, the vaccine is out and everybody is vaccinated, and then that's how you kill a virus. That is, <laughs> that's the only way. And we're and, a year away from even developing a vaccine, right? That's right. We're a, a year, to, you know, at least a year away, and so that's the only way to kill the virus. This virus. Um, and until then, you know, the same, the same um, protocols of social distancing and just, you know, social bubbling, if that's maybe the term du jour now of like small bubbles of gatherings are maybe going to become acceptable. Um, tra limiting travel, you know, all of the things that we've kind of grown uncomfortably accustomed to um, are gonna keep the the curve you know from hopefully not spiking again but i see you know i see three things happening um in the next six months which are there's an election coming there's a second wave of the virus that is 
a high probability and uh, compounded with regular flu season. And in the meantime, we are seeing this um, kind of culture of war really, you know, mounting. And so we're all keeping our eye on the story as it's unfolding on those high level points. And I don't know what specifically Frontline has, um, you know, I can't speak for them what they're, what they're planning to do. I do know that they have the, the story that was um, going to be coupled with our half hour back when it was to be a half hour, uh, the one that takes place in uh, the Midwest. I think that one is still coming together as well as a story from inside Italy. There is a producer in Italy that has been reporting and making a film. So those two films are coming this spring, I believe on Frontline. And then Frontline's website is a place where continued reporting will, will, will go on. Just digital, you know, digital print and, and some dispatch, their podcast, Frontline Dispatch will also be a source. So yeah, I mean, there, Miles, um, Miles and I were just on a call today and we're, we're talking about ideas too. So yeah, we're, we're hoping that we can still, you know, still go, go at it with this. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the most surprising facts that I learned watching this was when, um, I forget what his name is, but he, he he's a healthcare, he works in the healthcare industry. And he was saying, you know, if, if we go back to normal and if everything is opened up starting May 1st, by July, we'll be just, we'll be back in the same place we are now. Like it'll only take two months to make so much backwards progress. And that, that was like the wow moment. Yeah. If you look at Singapore right now, um, they're in that, they're in that exact example. Oh, really? Uh huh. They at first were um, kind of lauded for their um, strict measures in the beginning. And since then, mostly in effort to get back to work and because of the living conditions for migrant workers there, um, they're seeing a resurgence in a big way. Mm. Really sad. Damn. Yeah. Well, let's end it on a pause. Yeah. <laughs> so just um, some human guess, <laughs> what, what, what advice would you have for any aspiring, um, content creators or documentary producers or female filmmakers um, to kind of like ch chase chase a project like you did? Like what, what advice would you have about, you know, making this into your career and being successful? Okay, well, I think that, um, you know, first of all, I guess the, the, the real backstory reason to why it was possible for me to be part of this project was because of, the, the, long, the, the many years on the continuum of this career path that I've chosen is that, you know, the last time I worked with Miles was nine years ago, but we did a good job together and we liked working together. And, you know, I had been, you know, producing for Frontline before. And even though it had been five years producing for Frontline, you know, I, I, I have the uh, respect of, of the executive producer there. And so I would say that if, if you're, that, that there's a there's a real element of karma in production that um, you know you, you can never you can never assume that you'll never work with someone again because the, the chances are you will work with someone again or you'll cross their paths again. It's not that big a world our our world of documentary production, especially if you you know narrow it down even further to the PBS world of documentary production. So. If you're just starting out in your career, um, you know, just don't uh, ever discount um, the people you meet, the people you work with. Hang on to those contacts and you know, cultivate the relationships because you never know what you can harvest from them later. That's piece number one. As for the the um, immediate decision I made to go to Seattle that was more of a don't think just act <laughs> decision it was like i didn't don't even look think, just leave yeah, <laughs> just don't look just leap and i i didn't even really tell my husband i didn't tell him that i that i uh texted rainy and offered my help i told him after i did that that hey 
I, I just, you know, put, raise my hand and, and he is really supportive and said, go for it. And, um, he, you know, he deserved a special thanks credit and all of the spouses who enabled us producers to do our jobs and, you know, be the shadow parents of our children, um, so that we could do this. They, they deserve that. They're the unsung heroes in all of this. And my husband was really, really great. Um, it was not easy for him. He has a job too, and had to, you know, learn how to homeschool and work and it, yeah. I can imagine. So, and you probably didn't know it'd be a month, huh? <laughs> you know, he thought it was five days. <laughs> And then I called Oops, him. And said, I made another decision. Yeah. It's gonna be two weeks plus two more weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you in a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. Well, really lovely talking to you. Um, I'm so happy how this went. And I'm happy we have so many attendees. Um, really beautiful words. Thank you for your time. Well, I really want to thank you, Ivana, for your great questions and for the participants. Thank you so much for joining. Um really nice that you want to to hear about all of this stuff and um good luck to you all out there on your own films and um if you guys have questions you know how to reach me i'm on the board of whiff so feel free to reach out yeah and big thank you to whiff aka women in film portland and metro east community media for helping this event happen and hopefully we'll host another one maybe. Um, and we'll see you there when and if that happens. Yeah, great. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.